Hi, and welcome to Chapter 11, Bond Valuation. In this first part of a two-part series, I'm going to be going over all of the concepts in Chapter 11, and then the second part, I'll be showing you how to calculate the equations in an Excel spreadsheet. So let's talk about the required return of a bond, and it can be expressed in equation 11.1. .1. So in this equa equation, we have here r to the lowercase i would be the required return. And that's going to make up the real rate of return plus inflation plus risk premium. So for bonds, the risk premium, we're talking about default risk, credit risk of the issuer. The issuer going bankrupt, the issuer not being able to pay, liquidity risks and call risks. This is all in the risk premium. Inflation premium is simply the expected inflation. And then the real rate of return, this is the rate when you strip out inflation and risk. This is just the real rate of return after that. Add these three together and that's your expected or required return for a bond. So the risk-free rate is going to be the, the real rate of return plus the inspect, uh, expected inflation. So these two together make up the risk-free uh, rate. And it accounts for the interest rate and the purchasing power risk. Now, we, it's important for the valuation of bonds to keep in consideration the changes of interest rates in the market, uh, what are the underlying causes of these interest rate movements, and the term structure of interest rates and yield curves, how they can affect your individual bonds. And these are things we'll go over in this chapter. So as far as keeping tabs on market interest rates, so the market interest rates are very important because the, I think the number one contributor to uh, valuation fluctuation in bonds. So you have to remember the bond market is not really one, don't think of it as one single market. Think of it as many smaller markets. So the U.S. Treasury issues are one such market, probably the biggest market. Then you have the municipal bonds market and the corporate bond market. So those would be your three biggest Submarkets. Now, they are connected and related, but oftentimes when you're analyzing or valuing bonds, you want to separate the treasuries from the municipals from the corporate because they have, you know, all three have different tax, uh, different tax laws associated with them, and all three have different supply and demand aspects. Um, because somebody who's interested in investing in corporate bonds. When they buy corporate bonds, it's not generally going to affect the supply and demand of treasury. So that's why you want to look at them differently. So there's no single interest rate that's going to apply to all these segments of the bond market. They pretty much operate on their own sets of interest rates. So the yield spread is something we do look at, and that's usually the difference between these various markets. And what's very important is the yield spread between corporates and treasuries. That can kind of tell us, give us an indication of what people are feeling about the economy. When corporate um, yields start to accelerate and make a greater spread between treasuries, that could be a sign of a recession or a more uh, volatile economy. And when the treasuries and the corporates narrow that spread, that's a sign of a growing or more safer economy. Okay, so municipal bond rates are usually 20 to 30% lower than corporate bond rates, and that's mostly due to their tax exempt status. So like we talked about in chapter 10, municipals are generally exempt from federal and state and local taxes. This exemption um, makes them more desirable and it, it allows them to offer these bonds at lower interest rates and still have, um, still be competitive against corporate or treasuries because of this uh, oftentimes double or triple tax free rate. Now, General obligation bonds pay lower rates than revenue bonds because they are a general obligation that, that can be covered by the full power of an issuing uh, body or government uh, where revenue bonds are tied to one particular project. So you see if that one project fails, that may affect the returns of your bond where general obligation is the entire um, government that has to be behind it. Now, treasury bonds have lower rates than corporate bonds, and that's due to two, two, big re two big reasons. One, there is no default risk considered for U.S. treasuries, and two, they're exempt from state income taxes. So they can attract 
money at a lower rate because of these two features compared to corporates. Now, the lower the credit rating, this would mean higher the risk. And the higher the risk, the higher the interest rate, because the interest rates are meant to cover risk as well as inflation. So bonds with longer maturities provide, of course, higher yields and shorter maturities, uh, shorter term issues. Because it's considered riskier, the longer the bond is out there and the longer uh, longer time before it's repaid. Where short-term treasuries are typically thought of as to be safer because of their shorter-term horizon. But this is not always the case. You can get an inverted yield curve where short-term uh, issues have a higher yield than longer-term issues. It's a rare circumstance but can occur. And freely callable got bonds uh, pay higher interest rates than non-callable bonds because there's more risk and the risk is that the bonds can be recalled and refinanced if interest rates go down. Okay, so let's talk about uh, major causes uh, for rates to move. Now, inflation is going to be the number one most important um, variable that have effect on interest rates. And if we look at inflation, if inflation goes up, interest rates have to go up to combat the inflation because the inflation is part of that required return. So if inflation portion of your, your required return goes up, that means the interest rates have to go up as well. When inflation expectations go down, interest rates go down. And part of this can be, you know, it's also involved with the, Fe the Federal Reserves of different countries. If inflation sparks in the country, the Federal Reserve typically will want to raise interest rates uh, to help slow down the economy, which typically tames inflation. And of course, there are other economic variables that, that can have impact on interest rates, but those variables are, are always going to be leading towards some indication of expected inflation. So let's look at here's the behavior of inflation on interest rates from 1963 to 2018. So the blue is inflation rate, the red is interest rate. So generally what happens is as inflation goes up, interest rates go up. Sometimes inflation can spike. And in those cases, interest rates are going to have to be increased. And we had a huge run up of interest rates in 1983 as, you know, increased inflation was combated by the U.S. Fed greatly increasing interest rates, which did lead to a recession, which did, as expected, lower inflation. And then it, the Fed was able to lower uh, interest rates. So there is this re reaction relationship between the two. So let's look at some of the other um, reasons why interest rates change. Now, if we look at the change in the money supply, if there's a slow increase in the money supply, this can have, you know, um, a decrease in interest rates. If there's a slow decrease in money supply, this can increase interest rates. Now, the reason for this is, think about the amount of money in the money supply. If there's a, a slow increase allows for um, the money supply to increase and the people don't really have to struggle too much to compete to borrow the money. So there's actually a decreasing effect on the uh, rates of bonds. But at a slow decrease, though, is usually tightening the money supply. And this can have an effect of increasing rates as people are can charge more for the money that's available. Now, in a different circumstance, if you have a very fast increase of money supply, meaning that, you know, maybe um, a government has issued stimulus checks, maybe a government has uh, accelerated, quickly accelerated printing of money to fund a war. This typically has an increased effect on rates because this, a fast increase in money supply generally leads to inflation. Now, a fast decrease in money supply um, where if the money supply is in an inflationary position and the government acts to quickly uh, reduce the money supply, which the Fed can do by buying and selling treasuries, um, this will decrease the, the effect on interest rates. Uh, 
But the, the trick here is if it's done in a gradual pace, we get one set of results, but the very fast in pace, we get another set of results. And usually when something fast occurs in a big way, um, this is why we get this overreaction in the um, direction of the change in money supply. Now, this is not 100%. Sometimes these things occur, but the effects on rates are minimal or may actually go in the opposite direction. This is just the most common direction that the interest, the interest rates have moved when there's been these types of changes in money supply, but it's not 100% definite. Now, as far as the federal budget, if there's a deficit in the federal budget, that can increase rates because it makes the federal government a little bit riskier. It makes the spending of the federal government higher, which can put pressure on inflation. Now, if there's a surplus of the federal budget, and which all governments should really strive for, this means that it puts a decrease on rates. So when there's a surplus, the government isn't fighting for trying to borrow a lot of money. So there's less demand on borrowing money, which depresses rates. Where in a deficit, they have a greater demand for borrowing money, which does put pressure on increasing rates. So responsible governments should strive for a neutral budget or small deficit or a surplus. And that's really the best for the economic results for the economy are phenomenal. One ex example of this is in the, the last time in recent history that we achieved a budget surplus was in the US was through President Clinton, actually succeeded in developing a budget surplus and the economic markets in the country, the bond market and the stock market, both went up greatly during this period of moving from deficit to surplus. However, when a certain president named George W. Bush took office, he quickly took that surplus, uh, mailed each citizen in the U.S. a check, um, I think anywhere, maybe it was around $600 per person, uh, evaporating that budget surplus and then greatly increasing spending into a deficit stance. And that wound up um, putting some upward pressure on rates and then also wound up uh, causing the worst stock market period from 2000 to 2003 based on these decisions that this president had made at the time. Now, this happened to be a very unlucky president for the stock markets, because but the stock markets did tend to recover after 2003, but ended his term in a financial crisis, which ended in a stock market crash and a great recession. So just economically speaking, this president's policies um, was one of the last presidents in recent history to end an administration, to start and end an administration with um, negative impacts on stock market and bond returns. Now, if we look at U.S. economic activity, a recession, of course, is going to decrease rates. And that's what happened in 2000 to 2003, um, a recession occurred and this also happened in 2008 and this generally has a decreasing effect on rates mostly because there's less demand less demand in the economy for money and then also the federal reserve is pushing interest rates lower by decreasing them on the treasuries and now the the expansion of economic activity generally leads to an increase in rates as there's more competition for money and more inflation and rates typically go up. Now this is just the most likely scenarios, but this doesn't mean that the opposite can't happen because there's many other factors that can get involved and change things. Now, as far as Federal Reserve policies, uh, expansionary pro uh, policies are gonna decrease rates as they're looking, because basically how did they try to expand the economy? They lower interest rates and that's why the effect on rates is lower. If the Federal uh, Reserve wants to, um, have a contractuary change in the economy or rates, this is going to decrease rates, I'm sorry, increase rates as they start to increase rates to slow down the economy. And they usually only do that to reduce inflation. As far as foreign interest rates, if there are higher foreign interest rates compared to your local rates, this puts upward pressure on rates. And if there's lower foreign interest rates, this puts a decreased pressure on domestic rates. And this is because we're an international 
world and if there's somewhere else you can borrow money for less money is going to flow to that that foreign rate and that's why laws of supply and demand can also be involved in the change of interest rates so it's just important to know this these effects of these rates because this is a major contributor to returns and, and losses in investing in bonds and also a major factor in valuing bonds and now let's talk about the term structure of interest rates so we we developed this term structure of rates to make a type of relationship between yield and time uh, and comparing um, bonds and, tre and notes in a time scale of um, similar issues with similar risks so we can plot them on a yield curve so here's an example of a yield curve so here what we're looking at is the yield to maturity and the top the term to maturity so normally and this is looking at treasuries so usually most of these yield curves are going to plot treasuries so in the upward sloping yield curve number one this is the most common this is what we expect to see shorter term notes have lower interest rates than longer term bonds because you should be compensated more for that the increased risk of repayment of the bond through time so but every once in a while we can have this downward sloping yield curve which is an anomaly it does not happen that often or for that long and we're going to discuss why that does occur in a little bit so now the types of yield curves so the most common like we talked about before is this number one here the upward sloping yield curve that is the most common and most frequent stance um, in the marketplace now occasionally it does become inverted like we saw in position two here now this could be we call it inverted or downward sloping yield curve uh, and sometimes it could be flat where the short-term rates and the long-term rates are essentially the same and there can be a humped uh, in, where intermediate rates are hired so a flat rate would just be one line directly across and a humped would be sort of a um and up a a curvature where the interim the 10 to 15 year notes and bonds are higher in interest rates than the longer term or shorter term treasuries now how do we plot these curves well typically we use treasury bills notes and bonds because they all th what's great about these treasuries is that they don't have default risk and since there's no default risk that evens out or takes away one variable that can um, greatly affect the rate of interest on different securities they're also highly liquid which means they're actively traded and their prices and yields are easy to observe or get a quote on any time of the day they're homogeneous in the way that they have the same quality the same issuer and we're usually talking about u.s treasuries on these yield curves so we can construct these yield curves with other classes of debt you know such as we want to look at a rated municipal bonds or double a corporate bonds or certificates of deposits so you really can create a yield curve using a multitude of different types of bonds so here is two yield curves on the on the treasury similar to what we saw before this is in uh, 2018 we had a a upward sloping yield curve where short-term treasuries were lower than long-term treasuries but in 2007 we had so this last 2007 we had an inverted yield curve because the federal reserve greatly reduced the uh the i'm sorry greatly increased the short-term rates to help combat an ever-expanding economy so this is right before um a recession where the short-term rates were pumped up in a series a multiple series of a quarter point rate increases and left this inverted yield curve where the short-term treasuries were paying more interest than the longer-term treasuries now why people generally look at this yield this inverted yield curve or downward sloping yield curve is because it can significant it's a significant indicator of a possible recession which did occur later in 2007 in the u.s and most of the world so these are just some of the uh treasuries between 2002 6 7 17 and 18 so we can kind of see the overall change in treasuries on this time period 
And for most of it, between 2002 to 2018, we see that there's a slight pickup in the shorter term treasuries. And then two years and greater, we have a more significant drop in those treasuries. And that would be the upward sloping, the downward sloping yield curve effect. Um, so let's talk about the, ter the, the term structure of interest rates and yield curves. So why does this happen? So we have some expectations of where, where the yield curve should be based on a couple of theories. Now these theories ho hopefully explain, but they're not 100% proven. There's conf conflicting research on this, but these are just some concepts to think about. And they help explain the shape of the yield curve over time. And they're commonly cited in a number of papers and are generally researched quite often. So here are the three, expectations hypothesis, hypothesis liquidity preference theory, and market segmentation. Okay, so let's talk about the expectations hypothesis. And this is all about um, sort of a self-fulfilling philosophy. So if you expect higher inflation, higher rates, you're going to trade in accordance to your expectations. And then the results are going to be the, the results of the trading is going to be actually creating that expectation. So if you expect interest rates to go up, um, you'd, you'd want to purchase the long-term bonds if those bonds are for higher yields and short-term bonds. Hence, the yield curve is going to be more upward sloping. But when investors expect interest rates to down, are going down, they would want to purchase the short-term bonds because these bonds will offer a higher yield than longer-term bonds. Hence, the yield curve would be downward sloping. So it's all about expectors' expectations, trading those on expectations, uh, trading on those expectations, and creating these yield curves. So they, so this expectations theory says the yield curves are just an expression of customers' expectations about uh, the direction of future interest rates. Now, a secondary explanation here is we have the liquidity preference theory, and that's where long-term bond, bonds should be higher than short-term bonds because of the added risks involved in waiting longer to have your principal return to you, which we call a maturity, a longer maturity. So investors should view longer term bonds as being riskier, and therefore these bonds are a little less liquid and are subject to greater interest rate risk. So they should have a higher rate of interest to compensate. So um, because borrowers will pay a premium to obtain these long-term funds, borrowers thus you know, assure themselves that the funds will be available to avoid having them roll over in the short term debt um, with unfavorable rates. So this is really just investors, the basic down to the basic boiling it down to the basic point here is that investors prefer liquidity and safety. And that should denote the um, a rationale for the yield curve. Then the last um, explanation is the market segmentation. So here we're saying that the bond market is segmented in three segments, and each segment has its own set of supply and demand and investors. So the yield curve changes based on supply and demand within that segment. Short, intermediate, and long would be the three segments. So if there's greater supply, um, if there's much more supply than demand in the short-term loans, short-term rates will be relatively lower going down. At the same time, there might be more demand for longer term rate loans, and those rates should go higher uh, to match that demand. So this market segmentation is more closely tied to the supply and demand um, for bonds in each in of the three submarkets or segments, short, intermediate, and long term. Now you're going to ask, well, which theory is right? Um, well, it's hard to say, and there's no definite proof saying which theory is the most correct. So if we do look at the upward sloping yield curve, the results are going to be expectations about rising interest rates, lenders' preferences for shorter term loans, and greater supply of shorter term, shorter term loans should produce an upward sloping yield curve. Now, a downward sloping yield curve or an inverted curve should be resulting from expectations that interest rates are going to fall, lenders preferring longer term maturities, and the greater supply of longer term loans. So these could be 
you know, generalized explanation, uh, explanations of why we have these different changing yield curves. So, and again, the problem is no one can agree on which of these expectations theories um, is correct. But we can agree that, you know, these groupings of facts in the in the bond market will affect the yield curve. So how do we use this yield curve to help us make investment decisions? Well, like I said before, if there's for stocks, it's easy. If there's an inverted yield curve, you would probably want to sell stocks because a recession is coming. So the bond market's usually a better or a quick or a, um, a more up-to-date prediction of expansion contraction than stocks. Uh, some people say. So stock investors can use it as an indication of whether to buy and sell stocks. So what the yield curve basically does is it's going to provide investors with information about where interest rates are going to be in the future. And this is going to affect prices and returns on different types of bonds. So if the entire yield curve starts to move upward, that's going to indicate that inflation is expected or is going to increase. So as investors get a whiff or expectation that interest rates um, are going to rise due to inflation, we'll see this in the yield curve as trading, buying and selling of these bonds start to change the overall dynamic of these bonds. Now, and the season investors would start switching from um, to short-term maturities or intermediate for longer-term maturities, they see, because interest rates will affect the longer-term maturities more greatly than the shorter term. Now, what puts a wrench in some of this ability to analyze is what the Federal Reserve is going to do. And that's why the, nothing can move the yield curve more strongly than Federal Reserve decisions to increase or, short or lower short-term interest rates. And that can mess with the overall independence of the bond market when treasuries or Federal Reserves start to do different programs to manipulate economies and rates. Now, so not only could they uh, increase the the short-term rates, they can also buy um, buy back treasury bonds, buy back corporate bonds, quantitative easing. So there's a lot of things that can be brought into play to manipulate the economy that can sort of make the bond market difficult to really understand what's happening. Now, let's consider different the difference in yields on different maturities, or what we call the steepness of the curve. So uh, a steep yield curve generally viewed as a bullish sign so having you know um re so think of a, the yield curve as being flat if it suddenly becomes a much more steeper yield curve short-term rates are short long-term rates are long and it starts to the spread between long and short uh long-term and short-term rates start to accelerate this is going to be you're going to start wanting to move um, your money around. But the flatter yield curve reduces the incentive to move money from long-term maturities uh, into long-term maturities because you're not getting much of a difference. So think of this. If the short-term treasuries are paying 2% and the long-term treasuries are paying 8%, you're going to want to move your money aggressively into the long-term maturities. However, if long-term maturities are paying 3% and short-term maturities are paying 2%, Maybe that 1% isn't really enough to cover the risks of those longer term maturities. So you don't have much of incentive to move your money into those longer term maturities. Um, so let's talk about bond pricing. And we price bonds using time value money or specifically present value uh, form formulas for future cash flows or streams of cash flows. So market yields are going to be determined by, you know, um, our basic bond valuation model annual compounding, semi-annual compounding, crude interest. These are all things that are going to be factored into the valuation of bonds. So here's a basic bond valuation model. So we have periodic uh, interest income, coupon payments, and we have the par value of at maturity. So together, these are going to be the present value of the future cash streams. So what you're going to get is the first half of the equation here is going to be finding the present value of all the cash flows for the remaining life of the bond. And at the end of the year, at the end of the life of the bond, you're going to get your principal back. So we want to find the present value of that principal uh, at the current rate of the bond um, or the discount rate we want to use to N, which would be the number of permutations 
um, until the uh, um, to reach present value. So it's, so basically we're saying here the present value of the coupon payments plus the present value of the futures bond payment is going to give us today's price. So if we're going to get a thousand dollars in 20 years, we want to discount that to today, and that might be only seven hundred dollars. And if we're going to get twelve hundred, maybe we're going to get two thousand dollars worth of coupon payments. We want to discount all those coupon payments back to today, and that two thousand may become, you know, twelve hundred. So add these two together, we get what the bond value is in today's dollars. Now, annual compounding bonds can bonds generally compound semi-annually, but we could do annual compounding. You know, we need to know what the par value of the bond is, the number of years remaining, and prevailing market. Uh, yield to use as a discount rate. So this is we can plug these numbers in to get our bond price. Now some bonds may have a may have um, a compounding that semi-annual, quarterly, monthly, and those all have different ways of calculating. So if we're doing semi-annually, the difference here is that we have to divide the coupon, the annual coupon by two, and divide the annual rate by two. Uh, to calculate the the bond price. And again, there's a separate video where I'll be using spreadsheets to show you how to calculate this stuff. Now, accrued interest, when we look at accrued interest, we want to say when we sell a bond at some point in time, there is accrued interest that you've accumulated but hasn't been paid out on a bond yet. So a bond buyer was going to add that accrued interest to the bond's price. So the clean price of a bond is just the present value of the cash flows, but the dirty price of a bond is the clean price plus any accrued interest. So basically what it's saying is if you held a bond for five months and in the sixth month it's going to pay interest and you sell it after five months of holding it, you should get the dirty price and five sixths of the interest should be paid to you on, upon that sale. Now, there are three wide, the widely used metrics to assess the return of a bond. So if we're expecting to calculate return um, of the actual rate of return earned over a specific holding period, we want to look at a few different things. The current yield, yield to maturity, yield to, core, to call, expected return and valuing a bond. So let's talk about the current yield first. Current yield is simply taking the annual interest income divided by the current market price of the bond. So when I say current market price of the bond, I mean the bond between the birth and the death of the bond, the bond can be really at any price depending on how it's, re it's reacting to interest rate changes. So if we want to know what the current yield is, because we know what the yield is on the bond, its par value and its coupon payment. So the coupon payment would be the uh, current yield on the day the bond is born, but as the market price of the bond changes, that current yield changes. And this is the simplest measure of what, you know, the return of the bond that we could use. Now, yield to maturity is a little bit more complex. So what we're looking at, if we buy, it's a 30 year bond, but we're buying the bond in its 14th year, what is my yield to maturity? Because if the bond could be selling at a discount, I need to add that into my return if I'm going to hold it to maturity or when it, the bond is uh, pays back the principal, sometimes known as the promise yield. So this is the rate of return earned by an investor who holds the bond to maturity. And the principal is paid back and the interest payments are paid as promised. So it, ga it gives a better idea if I buy the bond today and hold it till it matures, what is my yield to maturity? How much will I make on that? So it's basically an internal rate of return for a bond. Uh, and here's an example of finding um, the yield on a zero coupon bond, which would just be, um, so a zero coupon bond, we would take the, the $1,000, which is the, the maturing price divided by the price you purchased it at to the exponent of n minus one divided by n permutations of the years minus one. Uh, and again, here is, Here's to put some numbers in that. So if we buy a, a zero coupon bond and we buy it for $315 and it's 15 year bond, dividing a thousand to 315, then to the exponent of one fifteenth minus one, we get an 8% yield on that zero coupon bond. Now, a yield to call. So yield to maturity, you know, 
is not always a good measure, especially when we want to think about we're purchasing a callable bond. So we can do something called a yield to call. So this is going to show the yield in the bond, assuming that the bond is called on its first uh, available call date. So this is sort of a what if scenario. And then so the time horizon N would be adjusted for the years to the, the, the bond is could first possibly be called. So rather than year to years to maturity, it's years to the first call date. Okay. And we use the, what's the bond, we use the bond's call price or premium instead of the bond's par value when we calculate that. So here's an example of a yield to call, a 20 year 10.5 uh, deferred call bond trading at currently market value at $1,204 can be called in five years. So we're going to have five years of interest discounted, one, two, three, four, five, and then the call price the return of the call price at the end of the call period divided by one plus the discount rate to the to the fifth power and that gives the um, yield to the the bond price so we can use this to figure out what the yield to the call is and basically we'd be solving for uh, the discount rate and again i'll show you how to do this using excel functions which is a lot easier so if you don't quite get understand how these are being calculated, don't worry, I'm going to show you how to calculate them in the second video. This video is really meant just to explain these concepts before we go into the calculations. Um, so the expected return, this is the return that investors who, um, who actively trade in and out of bonds rather than hold them to maturity. So this expected return, it just means that I'm not going to buy a bond and hold it till maturity. I'm going to be buying a bond and, and then possibly selling it at a certain point. So it's going to indicate my rate of return that I can expect by holding a bond over a certain period of time, but not for the full issue. This is could be called the realized return because it's going to show me what I'm actually going to be uh, earning in that trading short trading period. So we're going to have to use estimates of the market price of the bond at the expected sale date instead of the par value. And of course, this is going to be less accurate because who can really accurately predict what the price of the bond will be uh, returning in the future? Um, but the formula works the same way. We get the, the present value of the coupons plus the present value of what we think the bond will be worth the time we sell it. So we could just call it the future value. So it's compounded the same way. It's just not, um, it's accurate because we can't really be sure of where the bond will be trading. Okay. So if you're a bond investor, you're really going to focus on yield to maturity. So this is going to be the, the, um, the interest income expressed as a percentage that you're going to earn over your, your primary time. And, you know, for more aggressive bond traders, they're hoping to profit from swings in market interest rates. So they may actually trade bonds in speculation, expecting rates to go a certain way and that to be in their favor, whether they're long or short in bonds to make a return or capital gain, along with any, you know, interest they may in a short term period. Now, duration is an interesting concept. So this is a concept where we're going to measure the bond's price volatility and capture both the price and reinvestment risk, which is used to indicate how a bond will react to different interest rate environments. So sort of like a what if. So we can improve our yield to maturity because it's going to account for reinvestment risk and price of the market. So our yield to maturity will be more accurate. So let's spend the you know, next nine slides talking about this concept of duration. So in general, the bond duration possesses the following properties. Higher coupon results in shorter durations. Longer maturities mean longer durations. Higher yields or yield to maturities lead to shorter durations. So these variables, coupon, maturity, yield, interact to determine the bond's duration. So the shorter duration, the less volatile the bond price is going to be. So we can measure duration with this formula here. So the bond's duration is, at, is the average amount of time it takes to receive the interest in principle. So we can do uh, a weighted average life of the bond and calculates the weighted average of the cash flows, interest in principal payments of the bond discounted to the present time. So that is the, um, one way of doing it. And we also have the Macaulay equation duration, but here's the equation here. So um, 
This is what we call that weighted average life of a bond is the Macaulay duration. Okay, so here are the steps in calculating duration. Step one, find the present value of each coupon or principal payment using the prevailing yield to maturity as the bond's discount rate. Step two, divide the present value by the current market of price of the bond. This gives us the weight of the bond. Multiply the weight by the year in which the bond's cash flow can be received. And four, repeat steps one through three for each year in the life of the bond. And then add up the values computed in step three. So this, how are you supposed to really ever do this with these steps? It's very confusing. That's why we'll use a spreadsheet. When we'll set the spreadsheet up similar to what we have in this display. And I'll do this for you live when we, on the second, let me just move up this so you can see here. So this is a duration calculation for a 7.5% 7, 7 15-year bond price to yield at 8%. So our cash flows are going to be $75 because it's 7.5 times 1,000 because bonds are always $1,000 par value. Well, 99% of bonds. So anyway, the cash flow is $75 per year. In year 15, you get the $1,000 bond plus the $75 cash flow the last year back in year 15. So if we find the present value, we're going to take the cash flow and divide by 1.08. 8% is, is the discount rate or the yield to maturity, price to yield rate. T is the year. So it, we discount the amount of years in distance. So in the first year, we're only raising it to the power of one. Second year, raising it to the power of two, all the way down to the last year, raising the power of 15. So it has a much more discounting effect. So you can see here, $75 in 14 years is only $25 worth today, where $75 this year is worth $69 today. Now, if we take the present value of the annual cash flow divided by the price of the bonds, and this is going to be three divided by the current price of the bonds. So the bonds are currently trading at 957. And this will give us the present value um, divided by the price. Okay, so we get this factor here. So the price of the bond, if we add all these factors together, we get 100%. So this just gives us a percentile of value for each of the years of the, of the cash flow. So we get to the total. Now, the duration is the time is the time weighted uh, relative cash flow. This is where we multiply one by the year times the cash flow, and we get this time weighted relativeness. So when we add everything up, we find that the duration of the bond is 9.36 years. So we're talking about measuring duration. I showed you the calculation in the pre previous table. And keep in mind that this duration on any bond will change over time as yield to maturity term and uh, is subject to change. Now, duration for portfolio bonds is something else you can do. So this, we did duration for just, this is just one, one bond here, but you can do a duration for an entire bond portfolio um, and securities and their weights inside the portfolio. So the duration of the portfolio is gonna be a weighted average of the durations of the bonds in that portfolio. So it can be, and that's how it's most often calculated by that portfolio. So let's just talk a little bit about what does duration mean? So let me just put this as slide. I added this little slide, 5.5a of 10. So duration is a measure in years. So when we see the duration, like we saw here, this is, oops. I have to constantly play with this widget here. Is 9.36 years. So duration is a measure year. So generally the higher the duration, which is the longer amount of years of a bond or a bond fund, um, this basically means the longer you have to wait for the payment of coupons and returning a uh, principal. So the more its price will drop as interest rates ra rise. So Longer durations or higher durations measured in years, the more risky the, the bond is. And that sort of goes along with long, longer term maturities or riskier than shorter term maturities. So when we find the duration of bond, we're basically looking at this time, this time length. And the higher we calculate the length to be, 
then the more sensitive the bond will have to rising interest rates. So if, so if you're expecting interest rates to rise, you want, you're going to want to focus your bonds or your portfolio on shorter duration investments because those will be less affected by the interest rate risk. So interest rate risk, as interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So if you want to insulate yourself, say you are, you're a mutual fund manager and you have to be invested in bonds. If you see the interest rates are rising, you're going to look at your durations in your portfolio. You're going to sell your longer duration bonds and buy more shorter duration bonds so you have less of a negative effect of rising interest rates. Um, so you're going to focus on, and you could also focus on the mix of bonds and the different types of risk. Uh, and that would be looking at more of a strategy in your bond portfolio. And hopefully you building a portfolio that would be less affected by the negative impacts of increasing interest rates. And that's really the reason for duration is you're measuring the inflation sensitivity of your bond. And this is going to be measured in time. And the longer the duration time, the more interest rate risk your bonds hold. So <clears throat> the, if you're looking at the duration as a measure, this is going to help investors understand how the bonds are going to respond to, you know, the change in the market interest rates. As long as those changes aren't too significant, we're, we're talking about moderate, consistent changes, not all of a sudden rates go up 3% the next day. So the bond duration can be used as, you know, a predictor of this price volatility, as long as the yield swings are moderate to small. So because as interest rates change, bond prices change in sort of this nonlinear fashion. So duration helps predict how sensitive your bond fund is to interest rates it's because bonds move in that opposite. Remember, bonds move in the inverse or opposite direction. Um, the, uh, so interest rates go up, bond prices go down. Interest rate goes down, bond prices go up. So let's look at bond duration and price volatility. So we can take this modified duration where we take <clears throat> Macaulay's duration in years and divide it one, one plus the yield to maturity. So it gives a modified duration. So um, the percent change in bond prices, we'd say negative one times the modified duration times the change in interest rates. And this would give us a percent change in bond price. So this way we could we kind of bring together duration and we can actually calculate the, the direct change in your bond overall price of selling your bond in the market. Now, effective duration, this is an alternative duration measure uh, that's used for bonds that will be, that may be called or converted before the maturity date. So we'll call this um, effective duration ED, um, which is to note that if your portfolio is made up of callable bonds, we're going to look to that uh, call date or convertible date in calculating our dur duration. So immunization, bond immunization is a way of, you know, it's a, a way of another level of security. So you can derive a specific date of return from your bond investments over a given investment interval, regardless of what happens in the interest rates. So what we're doing here is we're seeking to offset the, you know, the change in bond valuations um, caused by the price effect and, and the reinvestment effect. So the price effect, what is that? It's a change in bond value caused by interest rate changes. And then the reinvestment effect, as coupon payments are received, they're reinvested at a higher or lower rate than the original coupon because you're buying what's available at the time and those rates change. So bond immunization occurs when the average duration of the bond's portfolio equals the investment time, time horizon. And that's when you reach this immunization from the changing effects of interest rates. We can see this expressed here. So in this chart, we have, we have, um, we have uh, T in eight years. So we broke up the interest in the eighth, the eighth year cash flow and the bond return of the bond. So if we multiply these by the time value of money and by um, the discount rate um, to the third power, we can start to calculate this um, terminal value of reinvestment of the cash flow uh, till we can get to a point where um, our investors required wealth at 8% is going to equal the total uh, reinvest, reinvested cash flow. 
So we can see how long would it take to get to that point. And again, it's something that we'll calculate in Excel. So if you don't understand the slide, that's okay. Cause it's, you know, it's really difficult to, to get these concepts just through a PowerPoint presentation. So the bond immunization, as we showed in table 11.2, previous table, this can be an example of using a 10 year, 8% coupon bond with a duration of eight years. So the desired investment horizon eight years is to assume that you purchase the bond at the par and that the market interest rates drop from 8% to 6% at the end of the fifth year. So to main, maintaining a fully immunized, immunized portfolio of more than one bond requires a continual portfolio rebalancing to, to, to satisfy this immunization concept. Um, so different strategies you can use if you're investing in fixed incomes to get, depending on what your objective is. And the strategies you can use a passive strategy, trading on forecasted interest rate behavior or bond swaps. So a passive strategy is one where you're not going to do too much. You know, your expectation um, of the changes in interest rates or bond prices is not going to be um, going to result in you trading too much. So your, your transaction costs will be very low. So some of these passive strategies, of course, is calculating the bond immunization and investing for that period. Uh, buying and holding bonds and replacing them as one bond matures uh, or the quality of one bond may decline. And you can also set up these bond ladders, which is sort of like dollar cost averaging in a way where you, you set up equal amounts to be, to be invested in various maturities, three, five, seven, and 10 years. And as the bonds mature, you purchase a new bond. So if the 10-year bond matures, um, you reinvest that in the ladder. So it gets spread among... The, the ladder. So as these are maturing, you keep spreading them equally among the ladder, and this will provide sort of a higher yield uh, of longer term bonds and dollar cost average benefits by reinvesting. So you don't have to worry about how the interest rates are changing and affecting each of the segments because you're going to continuously be selling and rebuying and redistributing. And that's how you formulate a bond ladder, which is a pretty common and safe strategy for bond investing. Now, if you're going to be forecasting interest rates, this approach is a little bit more difficult. So the strategy is essentially about looking at market timing. Same thing with stocks. If you're trying to time the bull and bear markets, so you're seeking to increase your return in the bond portfolio by making strategic purchases. So um, you're seeking capital gains uh, when you expect interest rates to decline. So if you're expecting interest rates to go down, you start investing heavily in bonds. And then when interest rates are anticipated to go up, you want to preserve your capital by selling out of the most in, uh, in, in, uh, interest rate sensitive bonds and putting that into cash and waiting to a period where the bond interest rates have topped and look to be coming down. And then you move that money back into the bond market. So this is um, something that active traders do, active um, mutual funds based on bonds may do. It takes a lot of time and a lot of research and often the, the results of this are quite mixed. I haven't really met anybody who's really been generally very successful because interest rates change in a way that's not always very predictable. Now, bond swaps occur when an investor sells one bond and simultaneously buys another bond to take its place. So you can execute this by you know, trying to increase your current, current yield to yield to maturity by you know, selling one bond and finding another bond to take its place. Hopefully, it's going to be at a higher yield. So you're going to try to play the market to get the best interest rates or that the interest rates are changing and hopefully improve your overall quality of your portfolio. And when I say improve, you're hoping to swap out a bond and replace it with a bond with lower risk and higher return. Um, and sometimes it could be called a profit takeout, substitution swap or tax swap. So these are just, just another way of, you know, constructing and manipulating a bond portfolio for better returns. Now, the yield pickup swap, this is when investors are going to swap out a low coupon bond uh, into a comparable higher coupon issue uh, and realizing an instant pickup on the yield and yield to maturity. So hopefully you can do this swap, uh, take the opportunities of the yield spreads as they're changing to swap these bonds, but hopefully you don't do it in a way that you're picking up too much risk. The tax swap would be selling a bond that's declined in value, using the capital loss to offset the capital gains of other bonds you may have uh, purchased and sold. Uh, 
So that way what we're trying to do is be tax neutral by buying and selling these bonds to create, a, um, so the bonds that in any particular year, if you're trying to adjust for taxes, you look at the end of the year and say, okay, I made $20,000 in capital gains in my bond sales this year. I have these three bonds that are sitting in a capital loss of 15,000. I'm gonna sell them now to, to offset my gains so I pay less taxes at the end of the year. Then you could go in after 30 days and um, rebuy those bonds to reset up your portfolio. So that way you're maximizing your tax exposure. But you gotta watch out for the wash sale. So new bonds cannot be um, purchased uh, to replace uh, bonds that you've sold. So you can't, especially for the same issue. Uh, until you've waited 30 days. So you just like the same thing with the watch rule of stocks. If you buy and sell a stock, if you buy if you buy a stock at lost money, you sell it to to lock in the capital losses and you buy it back the next day to get your position back, the, the IRS is not going to allow for that um, loss to count against your taxes. So you just be careful of generally waiting 30 days will prevent this. Okay, so that's the lecture on chapter 11. Uh, I look forward to you watching part two, which I'll be putting up soon, which will, it may already be up depending on when you're watching this video, which will show you in Excel how to calculate a lot of these uh, bond calculations. Okay, until then, take care.